Steve. <laughs> hey, Peter. Hmm. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Really excited for all of you to be here. We have some great presenters to talk about Florida politics today and election. Uh, my name is Sarah Clements. I'm a vice president of state government affairs with McGuire Woods Consulting and here uh, in Tallahassee in our Florida office. And um, we have three awesome people uh, who I'm going to introduce now. Peter Schorsch is our moderator. If you follow Florida politics, then you have most certainly interacted directly or indirectly with Peter. Um, he is the CEO of Extensive Enterprises. He probably comes to your inbox every morning through his political roundup newsletter, Sunburn, and is the publisher of Influence Magazine and the media brand Florida Politics and many other things. Um, so thank you, Peter, for being here. Our panel on the left-ish side, we have a political consultant, Steve <laughs> of Ancourt Jones Communications. He's uh, been working in communications and on campaigns for many, many years, uh, is an expert in polling and focus group research. So I'm sure we'll, we'll come to you at some point during this uh, event to talk about whether polling works or not. And um, just uh, has, has worked at all, all levels of state uh, and local campaigns. So thank you for being here, Steve. And on the right-ish side of the aisle, we have Joe Clements, who is the co-founder of Strategic Digital Services, which is a digital consulting firm also here in Tallahassee, um, has worked in the legislative process and on political campaigns um, also for a number of years, happens to be married to me, and um, though I'm biased, he is one of the best uh, people to be able to talk about big tech and the influence they've had in social media, social media's role on um, politics and influence on elections. So we have a great uh, conversation today and just wanted to let you all know that um, you'll be able to ask questions and there's a Q&A box. So please go ahead and type those questions as you think of them. And when we get done with the panel, we will um, open it up to Q&A to try to answer as many of those as possible. So I am going to turn it over to Peter to get us started. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you are my favorite Clemens of all that are on here today. Uh, I appreciate seeing my old, 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 man, did you just get back from Broward County? I mean, you look so old, Steve Van <laughs> I mean, you are I returned just, from the mothership, that's right. Sarah was being very kind the way she introduced you, uh, you know, just like he's a veteran of World War One's campaigns. I mean, Long tooth. <laughs> That's right. Um, and Joe, you know, I don't think I don't think anybody's been punished by having Joe and I other than Matt Farrar, his partner. Um, he and I will occasionally I think like once a year we will do a podcast together uh, and we will. It usually goes maybe seven hours. It is like this. Uh, we just bring over people. We you know invite Long the waiters to weigh in, uh, and so we will try and keep this focus and contained today uh, because Joe and I could we could just go for four hours about the impact of Joe Rogan on modern politics, uh, what the bugs are in our new iPhones, uh, the decline of civilization, etc. I think I want to start off by saying I am wearing black. Um, I just got back from a uh, funeral where I was asked to deliver a, uh, a eulogy for a 20 year old. Uh, so I'm a little mixed. I'm a little emotional today. Um, it's uh, it's a little tragic that this person was taken, uh, but I had to say goodbye um, to swing state, Florida, um, swing state, Florida, was uh, was born on November seventh, two thousand, uh, to the 
uh, George Bush and Al Gore campaigns. And um, uh, they were with us for a while. Yeah. Can you speak up? Because I think some people are having trouble hearing you. Okay. You Maybe want to yell? Yes. Okay. Um, and so I got back from that funeral today. Um, they, uh, I'm a little saddened by that as we, uh, as we see Swing Slate Florida now transition into Battleground Florida, uh, not as interesting. Uh, and that comes after a decisive victory for Republicans um, in this election. So um, I, wanna, I wanna talk about that. Um, and I wanna talk about some of the down ballot stuff I know Steve was in Broward. Joe, I know you were involved in a statewide campaign. Um, Steve, give me your top lines on what happened beyond the obvious. We all know Miami-Dade. We've read the stories. Please go inside the numbers and give us a sense of what really happened um, in the presidential election. First, Peter, seriously, congratulations to you, Florida Politics and Extensive Enterprises. Nobody covered the elections wall to wall, bumper to bumper, in real time like you guys did. Uh, we were trying to set up a podcast. You had like 19 things posting. It was pretty remarkable. Uh, there wasn't even a close second this year. In the years past, it's been, oh, Politico's keeping up. Fantastic work. And in the middle of that, you put out a magazine uh, and several podcasts. Well, so, so, so kudos to you. You know, uh, I, I think the, the outcome of this election was predetermined by uh, a number that many of us just sort of looked past at the time. And it really tells the story, which is the Republican Party in the off season, while the Democrats were bragging how they were not going to go door to door, they were not going to knock on doors, they were not going to interfere with people during the crisis, the, the pandemic, the Republican Party said to hell with that. And they went out and they outregistered uh, Democrats by 200,000 new voters, most of whom is turning out, looks like they came and voted. You wipe away everything else, and that makes the big difference. Uh, the gap that uh, Trump won the state by was, was larger than he won it by last time. Um, and, I, and, I, and, and, you know, it was up and down the ballot. And there's nothing more telling than today. The Democratic Party did a press release, uh, the first one that I saw, a celebratory, an oddly celebratory press release, bragging, as it were, about all the city commission seats that they won, most of which are nonpartisan. Uh, I thought it was a shameful press release. Somebody should be taking uh, 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 a knee and saying, wow, we really screwed up. We missed it. We didn't register new voters. We didn't get people in the can. So I think that tells the beginning of the story. Yeah, we all get it. Miami-Dade uh, was a critical element of failure for the Democrats. And I think what you were going to find when we get uh, more detailed numbers back is the reason why I think Democrats misunderstood Hispanic voters. Democrats were communicating to Hispanic voters about protecting Obamacare, while Republicans were saying, you know, I thought originally that the term socialist was simply taking the word liberal and turning up the dial. And, and realizing uh, that the term socialist was cue to a lot of crossover Hispanic voters who second, third generation said, socialism is where my family fled. Socialism is where I don't want to go back to. And while Democrats were, were lurching to the left, becoming the Black Lives Matter party, uh, and we saw it front and center in, his, in, um, um, in you know, Hispanic heavy, uh, Miami day that we don't like that. And so I think what you saw was not just an operational repudiation, but it was a repudiation of a lot of the messaging coming out of the Democratic Party. And if nothing else, Miami was top to bottom, except for the mayor of the city uh, of Miami, which went to a progressive woman. I think you saw a, 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 a top to down beating. Now, I'm, I'm seeing some other analysis that this was universal. You had extraordinary high turnout. In the counties that Trump won, you had three percentage points higher in turnout than in counties where uh, where Biden won. Um, so I think I think the misunderstanding of the culture of Hispanic voters, uh, the lurching to the left, turning them off, and of course the battle for the suburbs was was lost. Uh, Any more of these races are about urban versus rural, turnout, 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 and then a battle in the suburbs. And Peter, you and I had many conversations about this, but 
we thought the suburban housewives would, 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 would flock to Biden. I just don't see any evidence that it happened here. But what's interesting about it, it appears that it happened in other states. When you look at Arizona for the first time going blue in a long time, Nevada seems to be headed blue. Pennsylvania is going to be a nail biter. Georgia is going to be a nail biter when all is said and done. Florida is officially Texas 10 years ago. I think that's one of the most interesting trends is, and this is now two cycles in a row, Florida is disconnected from the national trends in terms of blue wave. I mean, there was a blue wave in 2018, um, and that clearly did not get all the way up onto the shore in Florida. And I don't want to, there's, there's definitely not a blue wave at the national level, especially when you look inside the numbers of the U.S. Senate races and the congressional races. But there was certainly a a, cent, a, a, a recentering of the politics, um, and that did not happen in Florida. Joe, I want to ask you. And I, I'm 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 begging you to keep your answer to less than 14 minutes. Um, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> something cultural is going on here, though, right? I mean, and that's that's bigger. I mean, everybody wants to slice and dice all the data, but I I I get that I'm going to get an answer from you that says this was right in front of a lot of people outside of politics. When you look at what was happening with um, the response to the civil unrest, when you listen to podcasts like Joe Rogan, like we were talking about, when you, when you start to listen to some of the uh, people that voted for Donald Trump, this just wasn't about a choice between Republican and Democrat. This was something bigger than that. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think there's this broad sense uh, across the political spectrum that, um, and you can describe this group of people like the professional management class or the coastal elites or whatever you want to talk to them uh, about as, but the people who run the institutions that run the country. So run government, run universities, run major corporations, run the big nonprofits, uh, you know, pick your institution. Uh, that by and large, two things are going on there. One is uh, increasingly people don't believe that they do a very good job running those institutions, that the meritocracy itself is not functioning. Uh, and two, that they haven't done a really good job for 20 or 30 years. So um, every major institution in the country has just a, a like cataclysmic failing in the last two decades. You have 9-11, you have two endless wars, uh, you have a pharmaceutical-induced like pill pandemic in big parts of the country. Uh, you have the housing crisis. Uh, you know, you have all of these things that none of these institutions appear to be working very well, and the people who run them don't seem to be able to admit that they're not working very well. And so the answer seems to be this like cultural double down on like you know it's not it's not us not running it well. It's you not doing you know what you're told or what we want you to do. And so on the left, the way they look at it is it's a class issue. Or I'm sorry, on the left, it's a race issue. Uh, the reason the country doesn't run very well uh, is there's entrenched racism in every part, and that prevents uh, the most qualified people or the most diverse array of voices from being heard to solve the problems. On the right, it's a class issue. Uh, the issue is there's rich people that live on the coast. They think they're better than everybody. Uh, but really, it's not uh, elitism. It's just credentialism. They have to. Um, you
you, Steve. <laughs> hey, Peter. Hmm. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Really excited for all of you to be here. We have some great presenters to talk about Florida politics today and election. Uh, my name is Sarah Clements. I'm a Vice President of State Government Affairs with McGuire Woods Consulting and here uh, in Tallahassee in our Florida office. And um, we have three Austin people uh, who I'm going to introduce now. Peter Schorsch is our moderator. If you follow Florida politics, then you have most certainly interacted directly or indirectly with Peter. Um, he is the CEO of Extensive Enterprises. He probably comes to your inbox every morning through his political roundup newsletter, Sunburn, and is the publisher of Influence Magazine and the media brand Florida Politics and many other things. Um, so thank you, Peter, for being here. Our panel on the left-ish side, we have a political consultant, Steve, <laughs> of Ancor Jones Communications. He's uh, been working in communications and on campaigns for many, many years, uh, is an expert in polling and focus group research. So I'm sure we'll, we'll come to you at some point during this uh, event to talk about whether polling works or not. And um, just uh, has, has worked at all, all levels of state uh, and local campaigns. So thank you for being here, Steve. And on the right-ish side of the aisle, we have Joe Clements, who is the co-founder of Strategic Digital Services, which is a digital consulting firm also here in Tallahassee, um, has worked in the legislative process and on political campaigns um, also for a number of years, happens to be married to me, and um, though I'm biased, he is one of the best uh, people to be able to talk about big tech and the influence they've had in social media, social media's role on um, politics and influence on elections. So we have a great uh, conversation today and just wanted to let you all know that um, you'll be able to ask questions and there's a Q&A box. So please go ahead and type those questions as you think of them. And when we get done with the panel, we will um, open it up to Q&A to try to answer as many of those as possible. So I am going to turn it over to Peter to get us started. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you are my favorite Clements of all that are on here today. Uh, I appreciate seeing my old, old, old. Man, did you just get back from Broward County? I mean, you look so old, Steve Van <laughs> I mean, you are I returned just, from the mothership, that's right. Sarah was being very kind the way she introduced you, uh, you know, just like he's a veteran of World War One's campaigns. I mean, Long tooth. You know, <laughs> That's right. Um, and Joe, you know, I don't think I don't think anybody's been punished by having Joe and I other than Matt Farrar, his partner. Um, he and I will occasionally I think like once a year we will do a podcast together uh, and we will it usually goes maybe seven hours. It is like this, uh, we just bring over people. We you know invite Long the one. waiters to weigh in. Uh, and so we will try and keep this focused and contained today uh, because Joe and I could, we could just go for four hours about the impact of Joe Rogan on modern politics, uh, what the bugs are in our new iPhones, uh, the decline of civilization, et cetera. Um, I think I want to start off by saying I am wearing black. Um, I just got back from a uh, funeral where I was asked to deliver a, uh, a eulogy for a 20 year old. Uh, so I'm a little mixed. I'm a little emotional today. Um, it's uh, it's a little tragic that this person was taken, uh, but I had to say goodbye um, to swing state, Florida, um, swing state, Florida, was uh, was born on November 7th, 2000, uh, to the 
uh, George Bush and Al Gore campaigns. And um, uh, they were with us for a while. Can you speak up? Because I think some people are having trouble hearing you. Okay. You want me to yell? Yes. Okay. Um, And so I got back from that funeral today. Um, uh, I'm a little saddened by that as we we see Swing Slate Florida now transition into Battleground Florida, uh, not as interesting. uh, And that comes after a decisive victory for Republicans um, in this election. So um, I want to... I want to talk about that, um, and I want to talk about some of the down ballot stuff. I know Steve was in Broward. Joe, I know you were involved in a statewide campaign. Um, Steve, give me your top lines on what happened beyond the obvious. We all know Miami Dade. We've read the stories. Please go inside the numbers and give us a sense of what really happened um, in the presidential election. First, Peter, seriously, congratulations to you, Florida politics and extensive enterprises. Nobody covered the elections wall to wall, bumper to bumper in real time like you guys did. Uh, We were trying to set up a podcast. You had like 19 things posting. It was pretty remarkable. Uh, There wasn't even a close second this year. In years past, it's been, oh, Politico's keeping up. Fantastic work. And in the middle of that, you put out a magazine. Uh, and several podcasts. Well, so, so so kudos to you. You know, uh, I, I think the the outcome of this election was predetermined by uh, a number that many of us just sort of looked past at the time, and it really tells the story, which is the Republican Party in the off season, while the Democrats were bragging how they were not going to go door to door, they were not going to knock on doors, they were not going to interfere with people during the crisis, the, the pandemic. The Republican Party said to hell with that. And they went out and they outregistered uh, Democrats by 200,000 new voters, most of whom is turning out, looks like they came and voted. You wipe away everything else, and that makes the big difference. Uh, the gap that uh, Trump won the state by was, was larger than he won it by last time. Um, and, I, and, I, and, and, you know, it was up and down the ballot. And there's nothing more telling than today. The Democratic Party did a press release, uh, the first one that I saw, a celebratory, an oddly celebratory press release, bragging, as it were, about all the city commission seats that they won, most of which are nonpartisan. Uh, I thought it was a shameful press release. Somebody should be taking uh, a, a, a knee and saying, wow, we really screwed up. We missed it. We didn't register new voters. We didn't get people in the can. So I think that tells the beginning of the story. Yeah, we all get it. Miami-Dade uh, was a critical element of failure for the Democrats. And I think what you were going to find when we get uh, more detailed numbers back is the reason why I think Democrats misunderstood Hispanic voters. Democrats were communicating to Hispanic voters about protecting Obamacare, while Republicans were saying, you know, I thought originally that the term socialist was simply taking the word liberal and turning up the dial. And, and realizing uh, that the term socialist was cue to a lot of crossover Hispanic voters who were second, third generation said, socialism is where my family fled. Socialism is where I don't want to go back to. And while Democrats were, were lurching to the left, becoming the Black Lives Matter party, uh, and we saw it front and center in, his, in, um, um, in you know, Hispanic heavy uh, Miami day that we don't like that. And so I think what you saw was not just an operational repudiation, but it was a repudiation of a lot of the messaging coming out of the Democratic Party. And if nothing else, Miami was top to bottom, except for the mayor of the city uh, of Miami, which went to a progressive woman. I think you saw a, a, a top to down beating. Now, I'm, I'm seeing some other analysis that this was universal. You had extraordinary high turnout. In the counties that Trump won, you had three percentage points higher in turnout than in counties where uh, where Biden won. Um, so I think I think the misunderstanding of the culture of Hispanic voters, uh, the lurching to the left, turning them off, and of course the battle for the suburbs was was lost. Uh, Any more of these races are about urban versus rural, turnout, 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 and then a battle in the suburbs. And Peter, you and I had many conversations about this, but 
we thought the suburban housewives would 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 flock to Biden. I just don't see any evidence that it happened here. But what's interesting about it, it appears that it happened in other states. When you look at Arizona for the first time going blue in a long time, Nevada seems to be headed blue. Pennsylvania is going to be a nail biter. Georgia is going to be a nail biter when all is said and done. Florida is officially Texas 10 years ago. I think that's one of the most interesting trends is, and this is now two cycles in a row, Florida is disconnected from the national trends in terms of blue wave. I mean, there was a blue wave in 2018, um, and that clearly did not get all the way up onto the shore in Florida. And I don't want to, there's, there's definitely not a blue wave at the national level, especially when you look inside the numbers of the U.S. Senate races and the congressional races, but there was certainly a, a, cent, a, a, a recentering of the politics. Um, and that did not happen in Florida. Joe, I want to ask you, and I'm, 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 I'm begging you to keep your answer to less than 14 minutes. Um, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> something cultural is going on here, though. Right. I mean, and that's that's bigger. I mean, everybody wants to slice and dice all the data, but I I, I get that I'm going to get an answer from you that says this was right in front of a lot of people outside of politics. When you look at what was happening with uh, the response to the civil unrest, when you listen to podcasts like Joe Rogan, like we were talking about, when you when you start to listen to some of the of people that voted for Donald Trump, this just wasn't about a choice between Republican and Democrat. This was something bigger than that. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think there's this broad sense uh, across the political spectrum that, um, and you can describe this group of people like the professional management class or the coastal elites or whatever you want to talk to them uh, about as, but the people who run the institutions that run the country. So run government, run universities, run major corporations, run the big nonprofits, uh, you know, pick your institution uh, that by and large, two things are going on there. One is uh, increasingly, people don't believe that they do a very good job running those institutions, that the meritocracy itself is not functioning. Uh, and two, that they haven't done a really good job for 20 or 30 years. So um, every major institution in the country has just a, a like cataclysmic failing in the last two decades. You have 9-11, you have two endless wars, uh, you have a pharmaceutical-induced like pill pandemic in big parts of the country. Uh, you had the housing crisis. Uh, you know, you have all of these things that none of these institutions appear to be working very well. And the people who run them don't seem to be able to admit that they're not working very well. And so the answer seems to be this like cultural double down on like, you know, it's not, it's not us not running it well, it's you not doing, you know, what you're told or what we want you to do. And so on the left, the way they look at it is it's a class issue, or I'm sorry, on the left, it's a race issue. Uh, the reason the country doesn't run very well uh, is there's entrenched racism in every part, and that prevents uh, the most qualified people or the most diverse array of voices from being heard to solve the problems. On the right, it's a class issue. Uh, the issue is there's rich people that live on the coast. They think they're better than everybody. Uh, but really, it's not uh, elitism. It's just credentialism. They happen to go to the right school and hold the right job and that put them in the position they're in, and they're not really that much smarter or better. Um, you see this with people all the time, right? You're willing to tolerate a doctor who's kind of an asshole to you if he keeps you from dying and makes you feel better. You won't tolerate that if you're dying and you're not really feeling better. And so what you have is this rejection of whatever you want to think of as the establishment at both levels. You use this term red wave, blue wave. What we had to happen on Tuesday uh, were these two giant waves crashing into each other canceling each other out, and then like maybe it leaks over in the White House flips. One of the interesting governing things going forward on, is... I, I, Go I, ahead. I, I, I want to keep you to less than 17 minutes on these answers um, and, and, and just bring it in a little bit on when you say the red wave and the blue wave are hitting. Is that... Is that so that's at the national level. What was going on in Florida? Because it was certainly more red wave than blue wave yeah but turnout was big i mean we just had total mobilization right if you think of like world war one world war two total mobilization for war we just had total mobilization for a campaign 
every corporation, every institution, every individual was being drug into the battle, whether they wanted to be in it or not, and made to vote. So even in Florida, where Republicans won, um, Democratic turnout was still like pretty solid. Uh, you know, what you see in Florida is that it's a unique state. You just meet Dade, Hispanics, Miami Dade. But the other part is, unlike in, say, Atlanta or, um, you know, maybe North Carolina, uh, Florida is still a very working class state. Uh, most of the jobs here, they tend to be service jobs, but they're working class service jobs. So you don't have as many people like in the Atlanta suburbs and that professional management class has a percent of the population. Increasingly, even a lot of the people in our wealthier suburbs, they're not in the very fancy financial or tech jobs. They maybe own a drywall company uh, or they own a roofing company or, you know, they own a small chain of restaurants on the beach, something like that. So you have a different sort of, of culture here. Steve, if I had told you um, that we would have 76 percent turnout in Broward County, 75 percent turnout in Palm Beach County. 75% turnout for Democrats in Miami-Dade County. You are a veteran Democratic consultant, although you're definitely one of the few uh, riding the center lane. If I told you those numbers, uh, would you have expected the Democrat to have lost? You know, honestly, I would have, and I'll tell you why. Um, the What we saw in the midterm election was a record turnout by Democrats. But what you also saw was a larger record turnout by Republicans. You saw places like Collier County this year turning out 80, 90 percent, Sumter County, 80, 90 percent. These really high turnouts among the Republicans, which leads me to uh, disagree mildly with some of what Joe said about is it a race class? I think as the Democratic Party lurches to the left, I think it has scared some older, whiter uh, voters to, to make sure they voted. But also, um, the issue you're looking at is, uh, well, by the way, we, we have to have kudos to Secretary of State Laura Lee and, and, and Florida's election supervisors who managed a very different kind of election at a very difficult time and really are the gold standard of the nation right now. Who'd have thought we would say that? Peter, you started out with a kind of a tongue-in-cheek eulogy of swing state Florida, but remember what came out of 2000 was a lot of process reform that changed how we managed elections. And then the proof was in the pudding. Uh, we were posting up at 715 all over the state. Uh, 80, 85 percent of our numbers we were counting down. We changed the law to accommodate. So overall, we did a good job. But to answer your specific question, I wasn't surprised. In fact, when I saw the numbers start to trail off at the end in Broward, I thought, oh, my gosh. Uh, we are not getting this big bump that we saw. Let me give you one example, one number. Yesterday, 191 ballots arrived late at the Broward County Supervisor of Elections. Let me be clear, only 191 arrived late at the Broward County Supervisor of Elections. In past elections, on day one, it was 10, 20 times that, which means people lag, people lag, people lag. Democrats got in early and then just sat back. Think about this for a second. At the beginning of early voting, a uh, vote by mail, sorry, not early, but a vote by mail, Democrats were outnumbering Republicans two to one. They were rushing their ballots back. And every day, once early voting started, that number started to close, 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 close. And going into Election Day, it was Democrats were plus one. And on after all is said and done, Republicans are going to be better than plus two. So, no, I wasn't I wasn't terribly I wouldn't have well, I wouldn't have said this is going to be a great day for Democrats at any level. Um, Steve, you bring up that issue at the end, which I think is very important, the difference between voting by mail, in-person voting, et cetera. Um, Sean Connery passed away last week. He starred in a great movie, Hunt for Red October. There's a scene in it in which um, one of his protégés who is trying to destroy his sub ends up shooting the torpedo into him. Um, and he said, and there's the scene, you know, you've killed us. Um, did Donald Trump uh, pull a hunt for Red October here by telling his voters uh, throughout the country to avoid voting by mail and so forth? I know it didn't hurt him, per se, in Florida, but at the end of the day, when the stories are written about this election, did the Republican push against voting by mail, uh, did that end up um, uh, hurting 
Donald Trump? You know, apps absolutely did. And, and, and the reason it didn't hurt in Florida is Florida has a very long and established history of uh, working with Republican voters to vote by mail. And this Republican Party, uh, Wilton Simpson's Senate campaigns, uh, Chris Browse's uh, Republican campaigns, they did a great job from top to bottom operationally. And so where voters were nervous about the Postal Service, we opened up vote by mail drop boxes all over the state. And so you saw the gap closed by people using those drop boxes and where early voting was established after 2000 to prevent long lines, uh, almost as a backlash in minority communities. And usually the purview of uh, minority communities, the Republicans used it more than the Democrats did. And that's why they closed. By the way, I, I don't know that you and I had a chance to talk, but when I saw no bump on Souls to the Polls Sunday, the last Sunday before the election, I thought it's over in Florida. I, I, I said Trump was going to win because we didn't see the level of enthusiasm, despite the fact that the Democratic Party has become, to many voters, in their, in their view, the Black Lives Matter Party. When, when the data is finally processed, I'm going to predict that Democrat, Black turnout, especially among Black To see that bump that you expected among certain minority communities. But you, the short answer is yes. Him him attacking vote by mail took away a weapon from Republicans. And we're watching it in real time unfold as vote by mail ballots are being counted in, in uh, other states, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Nevada, every time they open up a batch. It was an exception last night, by the way, uh, in uh, uh, Nevada, in that they, uh, I'm sorry, Arizona, they closed the gap because there was a strong push over there. So some of the vote by mail didn't have that gap. But the short answer is, yeah, he, he shot himself in the foot, so to speak. Uh, everybody who's watching, this is the era of the Zoom camera. So we're just going to take a, uh, a second here to just to make sure that my audio is working better and making sure that everybody can hear me. We tried to go with the AirPods for one thing. So if it's not, I'm going to hear something from Matt and we'll switch there. But I just wanted to talk for a couple of moments there and do a a mic check for mic check one, two, three. Um, okay, let's go back to Joe. Joe, I want to ask you about a, spe a specific campaign in Florida that I believe you worked on. And I, I, I don't want to uh, I don't want to embarrass you, but I really think you could have won the, the stopping of Amendment 2. Um, yeah, me too. Passed. And so I want to talk about two things. How is it you can talk about why you think you could have stopped it, but first answer the question, how does a state that voted for uh, Donald Trump by three and a half percent also vote overwhelmingly for basically a socialism concept of a increased mandatory minimum wage? It would seem those two things are in conflict with each other, but they're the two big winners. And I'd like to hear why you think that they both passed. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, ec economic conservatism is, 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 not a, is not a viable political philosophy either more on, on, on either side. It's economic populism. So uh, when you look at Miami-Dade County, which, by the reason, the only reason this passed is because Miami-Dade County way outperformed for it than, than we have thought they would. And that's because a lot of those voters, low propensity, um, you know, unlikely Hispanic voters came out about 150,000 extra, they hit Trump top of ticket, and then they hit yes on to bottom of ticket. Now there's a couple of things, you know, one is $15 an hour may not be that much in Miami. Uh, so it doesn't seem like a big deal in, in Miami. Um, but, you know, but number two, the, the reason uh, Governor DeSantis didn't come out publicly on it until the day before the election, uh, the reason uh, Trump kind of dodged the question of the election is because the future of the right um, is working class economic populism, and everybody knows that. So it wasn't a, a clear ideologic, it wasn't a clear party bent that we could make on it. But the second thing, and the, what made this difficult, is the business community just wasn't, wasn't behind it. They didn't put any money into it. Part of it is they were afraid of being attacked for fighting it. And part of it is they wrote it off early because they, they didn't actually poll the ballot language. Uh, only the description was polled, or in some cases, just the policy was polled. But as you saw in that amendment, the actual ballot language included a fair amount of information on the economic impacts of it. So 
I, I, in total, I think that campaign raised uh, under seven hundred thousand dollars for a statewide ballot initiative, which is, which is almost nothing. Um, everything broke lucky for us in that race. Um, you know, the biggest proponent was John Morgan, but he actually was so bad in a lot of the interviews about it. He caused newspapers to endorse our position, even even in uh, liberal cities, uh, caused caused the newspapers to endorse our no position on it. Um, so, you know, I mean, the big thing is nobody in the business community really came out to play. It was really a small business grassroots funded operation. And to, have, you know, drug it from 69 percent down to, you know, 60.79 percent uh, is a victory. I think it's going to have issues when it's implemented, because if you look at some of the rural and small counties, uh, there are counties that voted 70 percent against this. This was this was kind of drug in in the larger counties to some degree that I mean, this is the legislature's um, the, the the reckoning of the legislature's push on preemption over the last 10 years was this bill. When they preempted the minimum wage or this policy when they preempted minimum wage from being set locally, or by the way, it probably should be set. Uh, it set the stage for this to happen. So go ahead, Peter. Now you're going to say and Vancouver, I don't want to embarrass you, but go ahead. <laughs> I, I can't hear you did you go to did you go to mute i wasn't going to ask you why you lost so badly on sarah sarah thank you for muting peter on that question i appreciate that next question steve are you aware that ballot initiatives need to get above 40 percent um <laughs> to have any shot of getting to 60 percent passage is that your question is that your question no. so so I, I by way of background question i do want to ask you a serious question about a, uh, about the initiative process um you were involved uh obviously in the idea to bring um all voters vote which some people um refer to as jungle primaries i'm not even going to get into that just yet i want to ask is the initiative process dead in florida Yes, it's dead for several reasons. Uh, well, it's dead for several reasons. You know, the legislature uh, back in the 90s, the AIF, the FMA, and the trialers uh, were at nuclear war with each other. And uh, in the 2000s, they kind of uh, agreed to a peace treaty to make it much more difficult to get on the ballot, more signatures, more restrictions on signatures, a higher threshold of 60%. Um, and now the legislature itself decided we're done with this. So uh, twice in a row, they, they put in new restrictions to make it much more difficult to get to the ballot. The numbers of signatures alone is we, we did amendment through. We had we, we ended up getting one point one million signatures. The way that they've constrained it uh, with registrations and all kinds of uh, uh, loopholes and things you've got to jump through to get to the ballot and now with the add on language that they put on there and, and no way to take it off or litigate it off. Um, I think we're seeing the end because, you know, it's 8% statewide of the, of the last presidential. So the number goes up. The cost is about, uh, you can reasonably estimate of take just to get to the ballot now, $10 million. 